We got sent a freaking laser beam, dude. Today we're looking at the laser engraver from Algo Laser. This is a brand new DIY kit that promises an excellent user experience regardless of your background in laser engraving. That's great, because I don't know anything about them. This puppy just came out today, but we've had it for a few weeks. We've been doing our best to put it through its paces. We wanted to find out what materials this engraver could be used for, and also what settings and parameters needed to be changed to ensure a successful job. Stay tuned to see our unboxing experience, the setup, the first burns that we did, and what we actually think of this thing. This episode is not sponsored by Algo Laser, but they did send us this unit for free, so thank you Algo Laser, and check the link in the description if you decide you want one of these too. So for starters, this box is actually kind of big, like surprisingly big box. But when we unbox printers, typically Corey struggles to move them. Well, that wasn't quite the case with this one. Here in laser engraver land, everything seems to be a little bit lighter. Lighter, because it's a laser. It's a laser light. The box appears to have everything packaged well. Everything seems to be pretty thoughtfully placed in there and wrapped up so it wasn't going to be damaged during shipping. Similar to what we've seen from unboxing the bamboo printers in the past. When Algo Laser reached out to me and asked if I wanted to review this thing, I was like, yeah, of course I'd like to do that. They mentioned that though it was the DIY kit, this was going to be a product that was very good for beginners and really focuses on the ease of use. That focus on ease of use is already showing. Having unboxed a lot of the DIY and maker style stuff, I've got a pretty good sense of a good kit and one that hasn't had a lot of thought put into it. And it's pretty early to say, but I think this one's going pretty well. So it's, it's pretty similar to the printer. There's a box, there's a gantry, it goes around and does the things. So nice boxed in extrusions as well. Yeah, put that into there, that into there. Just to be right, the right foot. Immediately wrong, so that one's gonna go there. And this one, y'all. Yeah. The one big element that I use to measure the effectiveness of a kit and the quality is how good the instructions are. Because they need to be able to teach a fool like myself or Corey how to adequately set the machine up as if we're a bunch of fools that don't know how to do it. Oftentimes, you get these mass-produced kits, usually from Chinese companies that get sent all over the world. Sometimes, these companies don't really have much regard for the end user, and they more so just need a template that can be adapted to suit all the different countries that they're going to land in. That's not the case with this one. These instructions are exceptional. I would even go as far to say that they are better, ever so slightly better, than what you would find with a bamboo machine. They are. This was a welcome relief because poor Cory can use all the help he can get after the Ender 3 V2 debacle. <sighs> So much. Oddly enough, this kit kind of goes together similarly to what you would find putting together like an Ender 3 V2, like similar to what we started the channel with. A lot of similar components, giving me similar vibes. The difference between a kit like that and this kit is everything's very clearly labeled. Even though the components are really similar, the instructions call out each piece and tell you every step of the way what you need to do to make sure you don't put the thing together wrong. Even two fools like us can follow these instructions. The main frame of the engraver is just these lengths of aluminum extrusion. They're held together in the corners by these brackets that also hold the frame up and work as little feet to keep the machine up off of the desk. The gantry is similar to what we would find in a Core XY 3D printer. It's a flying gantry that's run by belts and it moves in the XY direction, moving the tool head along the job. This model's the 400 by 435 workspace, but it can be expanded to be a 400 by 880 millimeter work envelope. 
The belts are installed around their pulleys and then pulled to tension before being cinched down using the provided fasteners. The entry level kit, or the machine kit, offers two levels of laser tool heads, the 5 watt and the 10 watt lasers. We were supplied the 10 watt laser. The laser itself mounts onto a dovetail joint and it uses thumb screws to secure it. This allows the height of the laser to be changed on the fly and quickly as you move between different thicknesses of material. Our sick little control box thing, dude. Look at that. That's nice. Oh, it's got like a lock. Ooh. So for safety, nobody can just come have Turn a kid it come like, you know, I like it. blind themselves. The touchscreen seems to be a quality unit and it sits nicely in front of the machine. One area that we did struggle with the instructions was in the cable management. It didn't seem all that obvious to us how the cable should be routed to stay out of the way. And the instructions didn't give us all that much guidance on exactly which way to keep them secured and fastened so they wouldn't interfere with the work pieces. This led to a lot of debate between me and Corey, a lot of trial and error, five, maybe even 10 seconds of really trying to struggle through this problem and figure it out. And luckily, after that time elapsed, we were able to figure out how the cables were meant to be routed. With that being said, we don't have any experience with these kinds of machines specifically, but we were still able to put it all together inside of an hour. And that's on top of filming it all and talking nonsense like we typically do, getting distracted. That's pretty good. That's pretty good work. Good work, Algo Laser. The most basic kit comes with just the machine, as well as the tool head that you selected between the 5 watt and 10 watt. The kit that we were provided came with a piece of plywood, a sheet of acrylic, as well as these thin metal cards for us to experiment with a little bit. Along with the most basic kit, the machine kit, we were also provided a couple of bonus goodies. The second box we were given housed the honeycomb board. It's this board that raises up your workpiece. It comes with a metal plate that sits behind it and then also some plastic push clips that help secure the workpiece. Now, as we're going over this, please keep in mind this isn't an actual review. We don't know anything about laser engravers. And especially be safe while you're using anything laser related. Wear the proper eye protection, Read the instructions very carefully. This is gonna be a good glimpse into how easily you could get into laser engraving if you wanted to. Because if we can do it, anybody can do it. The plate is sat under the honeycomb board and that's used to protect whatever your desk surface is from any stray lasers burning all the way through. The push clips are used to secure the workpiece by slotting into the holes of the honeycomb board. One of the more surprising things that I learned about this machine wasn't the ease of use, it wasn't the quick setup, it wasn't the sick touch screen that came with it standard, it wasn't even the app that was paired to it. Guys, it was the price. This thing starts at $300, $299, and depending on what laser tool head you get, it goes up from there. And on top of that, if you use promo code KEOPRINT at checkout, you'll get another $60 off. That's nuts. A few years ago, before I bought my first 3D printer, I was this close to buying a laser engraver. The bucket hacked together kits that people were using most often then started at like $400. And that was for a much smaller work envelope, a much weaker laser. Like, this blew me away. And this one has an app and a friggin' touchscreen, dude. The P1S doesn't even have a touchscreen. I digress. Let's set this puppy up. With everything put together and snugged down, it was time to turn this sucker on. We followed the on-screen prompts to set the Wi-Fi up and get the language set to English and that sort of thing. We moved on to downloading the app as well. You can control the laser from the app or from the touchscreen. We decided we were going to use the touchscreen as we dove into our first couple of jobs using this piece of plywood. 
This machine can engrave glass, acrylic, wood, and leather, and it can do the coating on metal. So we did our best to mess around with a handful of different materials. For the first tests we ran, we decided to use one of the many preloaded files. We decided on these cute little cupcakes as we figured out how to dial in some of the settings. Immediately, the first lesson that we learned was that of securing your workpiece. We must have bumped the table or something while the job was going because by the time it got around to the second pass, they were no longer lined up with each other. Additionally, as the laser moves across the workpiece, it heats up whatever the material is. Depending on the material, it'll heat up more or less, but that also causes it to move some. This made these push clips a little less optional than I was initially thinking. With the plywood secured, we decided we'd do a couple more test jobs. This would give us the ability to do some tweaking of variables as we did back to back to back to back jobs. We changed the number of passes that each job did, as well as moving the profile from efficiency to precision to see how that would affect the results. For this piece of plywood, we determined that the minimum passes would have to be at least two to get at least a halfway decent result. We did one pass for precision and one pass for efficiency, and we determined that efficiency on this material given these parameters yielded the better result. All that to say, these are only two of like a billion variables that we can tweak with this machine, including the type of material that we're using. Next, we decided we were gonna do a bit bigger picture. So I hopped onto the app, went onto the internet, grabbed a random picture from Halo Reach, this sick hero shot here, dropped it into the app and sent it to be burned away. Up until this point, the jobs that we were running would go for five to 15 minutes or so. This was the first job that we had lasting over an hour. I think we only did two passes with it. The workspace was about kind of eight by 12 inches, so certainly bigger than what we had burned before. But I want to reiterate, this was just a picture I got off of Google Images and just dropped into the file library on the app. It was very easy to then follow the prompts and begin the engraving from there. This then prompted us to set up things like the location of the workpiece on the board, as well as laser height and focus, and other things like how many passes we wanted to do. This job turned out pretty well. For being a random file that we knee-jerk picked from the internet, didn't do any post-processing for, literally just pushed send on, this is a pretty excellent result. I have no doubt that there's tons of ways to get a much cleaner and more crisp picture with darker lines and all of that sort of stuff, but like, baby steps. Baby steps. But again, that brings up a good point. Up until now, we had only run jobs on our phones. We haven't needed to hook up a computer. We haven't had to download an external program. We haven't had to do anything like that. Though there are options for that kind of thing. We just wanted to work off the convenience of our phone. In an effort to run through as many different jobs as I could to display the offerings of this machine as well as I could in the little time that I've had with it, I decided to move on to more materials. We looked at these little thin metal cards next. As I understand it, when it comes to laser engraving, the holy grail, the big watershed between little lasers and big lasers, is their ability to engrave metal and how much they can engrave metal. These cards offer a good canvas because they are metal, but they're coated black. So when you engrave the metal card, you're really engraving that black coating and not as much engraving the metal. With the cards being so thin, I imagine this laser could cut through that metal. I just didn't quite have enough time to check out any of the cutting as opposed to the engraving that we focused on for this video. So I burned this picture of uh, Master Chief's helmet from Halo. I did two passes on one and three passes on the other. Initially the three pass jobs seemed to yield a better result, but when I looked at them a little bit closer it had really just loosened the material on both of these jobs. And so you rub them off and they kind of look the same. 
The next round of jobs that Corey and I wanted to run were these PETG discs I ran off quick, and we decided we were going to burn the Keo logo into them. We wanted to start tweaking settings so we could do some more quick side-by-side -side comparisons to begin wrapping our heads around all of these different parameters that we have available to tweak and to see what everything kind of did. Again, we mostly messed with the number of passes that each job would do, but we also decided to mess with the speed at this point and a couple of other things like laser intensity just a tiny bit. When we dropped the speed down, it resulted in a deeper cut, which kind of makes sense, but until this point, we had only gotten deeper cuts by doing multiple passes, or increasing the number of passes on a job. Typically, the default speed for this is running a job at 12,000 millimeters a minute. This one, we cut in half and ran at 6,000 millimeters a minute. I'm sure depending on the job and depending on the material, there would be advantages to doing one pass at half speed, for example, instead of two passes at full speed. But inside the confines of this video, this was good learning. We also took some time to burn into this acrylic that was provided in our kit. We left the paper on just to kind of see what would happen, but also because we weren't sure if you were supposed to leave the paper on or not. With the job set to one pass, the paper on the acrylic seemed to be a barrier, but maybe not all that much of a barrier. Though when we did do the job again with two passes, it produced a bit better results, so it made a difference. So during the last session that we had to meet and mess around with this laser engraver, we wanted to do a little bit bigger job. We again used that sheet of acrylic, but we took the paper off this time. We used the other side, and I decided we were going to do the album cover for Close Your Eyes' We Will Overcome album. It's a detailed enough picture, but it's got soft lines. There's good color gradient, so I think it would be a good test to show what this engraver can do. We were running this job off of the app, and while it was running, it disconnected from Corey's phone. That didn't seem to be an issue, though. The issue presented when I reconnected on my phone to check the progress. The job was going well, and it didn't have very much longer before it was finished. I mistakenly tried to back out to the main menu and accidentally pushed the leave laser engraving prompt. That shut the job down completely, and as far as we could tell, there was no way of restarting it from where it left off. So we learned that lesson the hard way. Leave the thing alone. Just don't touch it. I would like to see a resume function built in there, but maybe it is in there somewhere, because when you look on the product page, it does talk about interrupted jobs being able to resume. So I imagine I'll be able to dive into this and maybe figure out where I went wrong. So we decided to finish off that failed attempt by doing the same album cover but by putting it on that piece of plywood. Corey suggested that we use this one to test the color inversion function a little bit. This one determines which parts of your picture are bright and which parts are dark. Depending on what material you're working with, this is a setting that you may or may not really need to pay attention to. Now again, this isn't a full-fledged review. This machine has a lot to offer. There's tons of settings, loads of functionality. This is just us breaking the surface. This is the tip of the iceberg in terms of displaying and showcasing what you can do with this specific machine. And on top of that, there's the laser cutting function that we didn't even get to try. And beyond just this machine, there's different attachments you can get, like a rotary attachment. There's an enclosure, there's an air pump. There's all sorts of stuff that we can then build onto this machine to get even more functionality. We're gonna be diving into this machine a little bit more, but as it applies to what we do on the channel with 3D printing. But let me know if you have experience with the laser engraving and what you'd like to see us do with the laser engraver as well. I've already got some ideas. Use the promo code KEOPRINTS and get $60 off of your order. Your already cheap order. Get $60 additional dollars off. Are you kidding me, dude? And let me know in the comments what jobs you're going to burn on this sucker. I already know that we're going to plan a couple of different projects that have to do with post-processing prints. What would you use this for?
Overall, I would say this machine is an exceptional value. It offers a lot of functionality. It's got some great features. It's still a budget entry level machine. In terms of the value, like I'm just blown away. And even beyond the value, the barrier to entry is still pretty low just because it is pretty easy to use. There's a lot of tinkering that can go into using this machine, I'm sure. You can put the thing together and be burning a job inside of an hour. Without a doubt, it's a tinkerer's machine, more so than like a bamboo lab, for example. But I was blown away with how easy you could actually get going on this thing. Mm, thanks for watching, bye. What if you don't?